screen. Um, I didn't want to do that. Share screen. Share screen. Uh, and I have a few intro slides that I would like to bring as I welcome you all. Welcome everyone this evening. Uh, this evening's Husky Bites is sponsored by Delta Sigma Phi Fraternity. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is, is Janet Callahan. I am Dean of the College of Engineering at Michigan Technological University. Husky Bites is a free interactive Zoom webinar that we, um, we're now in our fourth season. Uh, and so welcome again. Um, uh, and again, to, to ask questions, if you're live here on Zoom, you, you just go to the Q&A feature. So we are, this is our third talk this week, Lift Bridge. Uh, I will talk about the next week's talk in just a moment. I wanna just thank our speakers in advance uh, uh, for taking your evening to join us and teach us about what you know. Uh, and um, very pleased to have such a full um, and you know really fun lineup. As everybody probably knows, we also live stream these on Facebook. And so in order to participate in that way, you would just go to Facebook and then search for the Michigan Tech College of Engineering, um, or you can go right to that um, URL. So this is a, a, a poll. I'm always curious about who's joining us. Uh, last week, it was something like 75 or 80% um, alumni. Uh, and so I'm kind of curious to see who's with us tonight because we're featuring one of our famous um, historic landmarks. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see. Typically we have about you know, a mix of all these kinds of people, um, including curious people and so forth. And so I don't know if you can, I never can remember if people can see who are attendees can see the poll, but um, I'm gonna kind of read it out live. Um, so far we have 144 people joining us and about hundred people have answered and 71% of the people who have answered are an alum uh, and then about 13% are a Michigan Tech student. Tess, did you require this for your class? No. <laughs> what a good idea that would have been. <laughs> well, I'm impressed. That's, that's awesome curiosity. Uh, and so yeah. we've got friends and family, uh, family of, of a current or future student. We've got Michigan Tech faculty and staff and all kinds of people joining us. So thanks so much for conducting that poll, Sue. And I'm going to move the slides along. If you're an educator, welcome. As you may know, next week we're queuing up um, a professional development opportunity. In addition, uh, if you attend any one of these, you earn a Sketches, which is a Michigan Tech or a Michigan State um, uh, uh, term for continuing ed clock hours. Uh, and if you wanna learn more, um, I encourage you to send an email uh, to engineering at mtu.edu. Uh, so joining us next week will be Dr. Uh, Michelle Jarby Eggart, uh, who is an assistant professor in our Department of Engineering Fundamentals and co-host Amanda Singer, class of 19, who earned her degree is in environmental engineering. And uh, this is going to be speaking to engineering without borders and kind of how engineers can help make the world a better place and improve um, quality of life for people. Uh, uh, so look forward to joining us next week. This is my cue to stop sharing slides, so I will do that right now. Thank you again um, for um, to our sponsor. And uh, uh, with that, I'm going to now introduce um, Dr. Alborn, and I'm going to be formal because you're a professor. So, uh, <laughs> so Dr. Tess Alborn uh, is one of our very own alum. She earned her BS and MS here uh, at Michigan Tech. And then she went somewhere else um, for a PhD, uh, where actually I'll name it University of Minnesota. Uh, and then she came back home here to Michigan Tech in 1995, where she's been a faculty member ever since. She is a professor in the Department of Civil, Environmental, and Geospatial Engineering. She teaches structural engineering courses. Uh, she focuses on concrete and the design of concrete buildings. Uh, and Bridges, of course. Um, uh, she is a, a member of an important committee uh, for the American Concrete Institute. Uh, and these, this is the group that sets the standards and makes sure that um, the concrete that's being used is safe for, for us and will last the right amount of time. 
She is the mother of twins, which I was very impressed, which were born and during her PhD, which she finished anyway. And I, I'm impressed by that because <laughs> I only had one child in, during my PhD and that was hard enough. Let alone do it. Uh, Tess has a um, great, <coughs> excuse me, a very large dog, a great Pyrenees. Uh, she loves gardening and, and much more. Um, and then I also wanted to kind of give a plug. She's the program director for our online master's degree in structural, in civil engineering with a structural focus. And I, we mentioned this in the last season, but I should probably mention it now. Um, Michigan Tech now offers 27 different graduate certificates that you can take remotely. Uh, and so what's a graduate certificate? It's a group of three courses and you take all three courses, you, you actually earn a graduate credential that you can write on your resume. And then if you wanna take two more, they stack and three together is almost all the way toward a master's degree. So if you're possibly considering grad school, take a look at the graduate certificates and I'll try to remember, well, I don't know if I don't, next week I'll put a um, link to our homepage on there so you can see um, the URL for that. Um, so anyway, I've. I want to pass it on to Tess now to introduce other speakers. Thank you so much, Dr. Alburn. I'm going to call you Tess for the rest of the evening. Uh, thank <laughs> you so much for your work for Michigan Tech, and uh, please take it from here. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm going to ask Michael to go ahead and share the slides um, while I give a brief introduction here, because I wouldn't be where I am here today if it wasn't for these students. And I am just thrilled to be able to introduce two of our former students, Michael Prast and Emma Beachy, both graduated from Michigan Tech with a bachelor's and a master's in civil engineering. They finished up in 2019. Uh, Emma is currently out on the West Coast and she's working for Corbin Consulting Engineers. She does a lot of work in industrial structural design and mostly for semiconductor type facilities. Michael is one of us staying right here in the Keweenaw. He works for Fire Towered Engineered Timber. And that in that role, he does a lot of heavy timber post and beam design projects all over the world. They are two of the best and I am delighted that they are with us tonight because this project wouldn't have happened without them. One day I just happened to mention that we needed, maybe we should work on this and um, in bridge design class, they were both in my bridge design class and I mentioned this about these historic civil engineering landmarks and mentioned if anybody was interested, I thought the Portage Lake Bridge could probably, you know, stand up to the uh, criteria to receive this kind of award and they walked in my office not too long later and and that's what we did we started working on this but it was really Michael and Emma that took this um, by the reins so why don't we go ahead and switch to the next slide and I just want to mention that this program that and we we don't I see a lot of wonderful questions coming up and what we have to offer tonight is to talk about the lift bridge and why it receives this ASCE historic civil engineering landmark. And it's a national designation. So I'm gonna let Michael and Emma do most of the talking here because this was their project. They pulled it together and they've made it happen. So they're gonna cover the history of all the Portage Lake crossings before we start talking about the current bridge. I also wanna reflect on a couple of critical people that were involved. And part of the process is that the bridge must be at least 50 years old and it must have unique features for both the civil engineering profession and for the nation as a whole. So then we'll wrap it up too, and we'll answer some questions um, that we see in the Q&A. So with that, I'm going to turn it over first to Michael Prast to start um, with some of the discussion. Okay, so Dr. Auburn kind of summed up what our goals of the, um, of the whole project was, was to get this, uh, the lift bridge on the ASC National Historic uh, civil engineering landmark register it's a long name um, but 
we had some certain criteria had to meet, it had to be historical. We had to prove it's historical significance, um, talk about the unique features it had compared to other projects. Um, and then the ASC part of it, what did it do for the civil engineering profession? Um, how did it contribute to the national and uh, basically the larger region as a whole? And then kind of supply supplemental documents with that. So kind of in case there's some people who actually aren't from the area or don't really know much about it, um, kind of I'll go through a brief history of why everything's even here. Um, the Keweenaw was the location of the nation's first uh, mineral boom. Uh, so this actually happened before the gold rushes out west in the mid 1840s. It was very rapid growth, uh, 92 plus percent of all US copper was coming out of the Keweenaw here all the way up until the turn of the century. Um, and they continued leading um, production in those late 1800s while also producing some of the highest quality of copper beyond that. Um, lots of up and downs over those years with the Great Depression and the wars and strikes and such, um, but still pretty uh, profitable for most all that time. And then mining in general was continued into the 1970s. And so that's kind of a overview of the history. So now getting narrowing our focus back to the Portage Canal here in this crossing. Um, there were a few different crossings at this point. Uh, there has always been really one crossing and one location that people got across here. Um, some of the earliest forms was a ferry service, then they kind of created a floating bridge kind of gondola style kind of thing. Um, then they created a wooden swing bridge. You can kind of see in the top picture there. It only had one deck originally because in the 1870s, there was really just animal carts and pedestrians. And then it was adapted for rail in 1892 um, as trains became a lot more prevalent in the area. That's kind of the middle picture there, still wood. And then they decided so, to upgrade. So for, the, for the upper one, when you say a swing bridge, did that thing pivot? Yes, so the middle part there, it kind of um, kind of built up a little bit, that part in the middle pivots. Wow. So then you'd have an opening on both sides of, of the pivot point. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, and that's how all the swing bridges operated. Um, and then they upgraded to a swing bridge in 1895, a steel swing bridge in 1895. Um, this one lasted only few years before it got hit by a steamer and knocked over the entire swing span. Um, there's a picture of that next slide. And so I had to replace that part. Um, but a swing span um, carried it all the way up until the lift bridge was built. So the swing bridge, the final Oops. steel swing bridge was... <laughs> That's a big accident there. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so the whole thing tipped over and you can kind of see in the middle there um, where the, the swinging mechanism is basically. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Mm -hmm. It's a great picture. <laughs> um, and so this swing bridge could handle pedestrians, it could handle cars, it could handle rail, and it could allow uh, boats to go through. So why did they really need to, to, to replace it? Well, there were actually lots of reasons. It was, for one, structurally deficient. Uh, the foundations were failing in part because they had to dredge it out on each side to make it um, deeper for larger boats to come through, but that affected the foundation. And so actually the whole swing bridge would tilt to one side. Um, this caused them to have to shave off parts of one side of the swing bridge and, and add to the other side. Um, there were rotting members and falling concrete down onto the decks below, and so it was just very um, deficient structurally. Um, they would also have to spray the bridge with water on really hot days because otherwise the steel would expand and the bridge would get stuck. Um, and then it was also geometrically deficient. It had a lot of narrow lanes from back in those early 1900s. Vehicles were a lot smaller. Um, but they got pretty big pretty fast um, to the point where anytime any large trucks came across, including snowplows, 
uh, they had to stop road traffic from both directions because the bigger trucks needed to take over both lanes to get over. Um, it needed to open for all boats because it was so close to the ground that even your uh, modest pleasure boat couldn't get through. And then the openings themselves were, were a little too narrow for the larger steamships that were coming through. So we have our first polling question. Michael has given you some background of the um, status of the Portage Lake crossings. And the next bridge would be the lift bridge that we know today. So the question is, when did the current Portage Lake lift bridge open to traffic? And we have a poll going. Wow, you guys are really fast. There's 229 attendees online right now, and we have over 150 responses. So we'll let it go for another few seconds, and we'll... We're at 82%, 85% have responded. So what we have is if you um, answered C, 1959, you were correct. 1925, 1940 were early on when they had the swing bridges that we were just talking about. And 1972, um, well, a lot of us remember that and the bridge was well, was already here. So 1959 is the correct answer. Thank you for joining our poll. And now we'll let um, Michael continue on a little bit more about the current lift bridge history. There we go. Okay. So yeah, like Alborn said, to talk about now our current bridge, we kind of know how we got to here. Um, the investigations to actually replace the steel bridge or the swing steel bridge um, actually started in the 1840s. They um, were having right. troubles with it that long ago before they even got a new bridge. You know, it took 19 years to get a new one in there. Um, there were many different solutions proposed. They wanted different locations and keep this, the swing bridge. They proposed different types of bridges, um, thing, anything from a fixed bridge, which wouldn't have enough uh, clearance for the waterway. Um, it was too long for a bascule bridge, which are the, the, basically the draw bridges. And then swing bridges had been used this whole time, but hadn't really worked properly. Um, so they finally decide on design in 1953. Um, and they finally got the funding because it was deemed an unreasonable obstruction to the free navigation of the waterway, which is very important for the Lake Carrier Association. And so they were kind of the ones who actually pushed to get the new bridge going. And then in 1956, once all that funding was uh, um, received, then Hazlett and Erdahl was hired to design the new lift bridge. So construction began on December 18th, 1957. Uh, so it was actually a winter start. Um, they worked from winter to winter, 1957 to 1958, working on the foundations. So the way that the foundations were done for the main towers and one of the um, support piers was to basically build a sand island and uh, go with the caisson method. So they would build this island out in the middle of the canal uh, fill up with sand, so it would solid. Um, then they construct, you can kind of see that uh, sand island on that top picture there. Uh, then they constructed what was called a, a caisson, and so basically a big hollow um, concrete structure. You can see that in that middle picture there, uh, built on top of the sand island. And how the caisson method works is basically they excavate all of the sand and materials out from the inside of the caisson and then it slowly sinks and they just keep doing this and doing this until it gets down to bedrock and then and once it gets a certain distance below the water level they actually send people down there um, with shovels to excavate it out because they can't get machinery down um, that's where we have to have it like pressurized and everyone has to go through decompression and all that and kind of where the, the Ben's disease comes from is if you um, came out of there too quick and didn't properly decompress, then you would um, get sick. 
And then once that was sunk down to bedrock, they built the piers on top of that. Uh, in February of 1959, the steel components arrived. Uh, they then began just erecting everything. Um, they started with the, um, the towers and building the approaches out to it as well. The lift span itself was built separately because they actually needed to allow the swing bridge, which was still there and still being used, to operate fully. Um, you'll see some other pictures later of the of both bridges in place, and you'll notice that um, the lift bridge is essentially built as close as it could possibly be built to the swing bridge and still allow the swing bridge to rotate. And Emma will talk a little bit more about all that as well. Um, so September 9th, 1959 is when the lift span was actually floated in place. Um, again, we'll have other pictures of it um, off in distance. And so it was floated in and they had to close the waterway and then they would lift the uh, lift span all the way up into the highest position and to complete the rest of the construction so that the swing span could still spin underneath of it. They had about three months of equipment testing with all the new motors and such in the towers. And then on December 20th, 1959, the lift bridge opened up to traffic for the first time. And then basically immediately after that, they started demolishing the swing bridge. They first removed the automobile approaches because the cars were able to drive on the new lift bridge. However, it took a little bit longer for them to finish the rail components. And so those were removed at a later, uh, a couple months later. And then uh, in the spring, they removed the lifts or the swing span because they had to wait for the canal to thaw. Um, there were stories, because we got to talk to one of the um, MDOT engineers who supervised the project. And he told us that um, as they were decommissioning the uh, swing bridge, they would literally cut the trusses apart and just let them fall to the ice. And then they would haul it off that way instead of worrying about trying to lift it off or be gentle about it. You can you can really see the difference between the lane sizes from those two pictures. Yeah, so that, that bottom right picture is a, a great one to show um, how they fixed some of the geometric constraints of the old bridge. Um, they added two lanes and it's on all the lanes are just wider than the other ones were to begin with. And so it's quite a bit different bridge. I can imagine having the swing bridge all that time and then seeing such a big structure go up to right next to it provides quite a contrast. Um, and then they waited till the summer to do a ribbon cutting ceremony. Um, and then they completed, and then the bridge was completed. It tripled the car capacity. Um, they had less delays, um, larger canal opening. Uh, they maintained full rail and pedestrian access. And so the bridge performed quite well. Um, that picture up in the top right corner is actually a pin from the original bridge dedication ceremony there. Um, so that was pretty cool. I have that in my possession given me by one of the National Parks uh, people. Um, and then uh, kind of after the construction now, uh, the last train went across the bridge um, in September of 1982. Um, and then on June 2009, uh, the bridge was 50 years old. There was a big bridge fest ceremony for that. Uh, 2015 to 16, which is much more recent, and Emma and I were here for this, uh, they did their fix 50 year fix on the structure and fix some of the electrical and painting as well. So um, there's a picture there of the, um, basically the lift span was disconnected from the towers for a while during the winter so they could replace all the cables and rebalance the counterweights and replace the balancing chains and all sorts of stuff. So. All right, so, so I can touch on this. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Emma. I was saying Michael uh, touched on this a little bit, but there were a couple of people we wanted to highlight um, who particularly made a really big difference to this bridge happening. 
Uh, the first of those is Carl Winkler, who was the Houghton County Road Commissioner from 1930 to 1964. Uh, and he was really the person who wrote all the letters, contacted all the senators and the Army Corps of Engineers and State Highway Commissioner, all the people who needed to know that the old bridge, the swing bridge was not working anymore and it wasn't safe. Um, so he, I don't, I don't honestly know how long it would have taken or what this bridge would have looked like without Carl Winkler doing the work that he did. And then once design was underway, uh, Tom D'Arcy was one of the design engineers working for Hazel and Erdahl, which was the design company. And we were able to talk with him and kind of get his take on what made this bridge really unique and what made this, what made this bridge interesting from a design perspective. And that was really helpful for this nomination package. And he was also, I think, grand marshal for one of the bridge fest parades a few years ago, which was pretty neat. Right, he and his wife, they were grand marshals of the uh, 50th anniversary of the Bridge Fest celebration. Yeah. So it's cool to, to see everybody who's able to, to come back to this bridge after a long time, for sure. Um, and then there's John Michaels, who is on the construction end of things. He was with the MDOT construction crew, and he's in this, this picture on the bottom row, second from the right, is John Michaels. Um, and him, along with another construction engineer, I think was L.H. Gilroy. I don't know if that's the same as the Tony Gilroy that was yeah, mentioned earlier. It is? It right. is? Okay. Yeah, so the two of them uh, took a lot of photographs and did a lot of documentation during construction and then compiled that all into this really comprehensive construction history report, which then John Michaels was able to share with us, along with a lot of other pictures and newspaper clippings that were really super helpful for this nomination package. So, and there's obviously a lot of other people who have contributed to the history of this bridge, but just wanted to make sure we hit those three. So our next polling question is, how heavy is the lift span? If you think about this bridge, it, the center span goes up and down. It has traffic on the upper level. It had rail on the lower level. It can lift to different positions. How heavy do you think that center lift span is? Is it 250,000 pounds, 1.5 million pounds? 4.5 pounds, a million, 4.5 million pounds, or 10 million pounds. So we have, again, 233 attendees on tonight's um, seminar. And welcome again to all of you for joining us on Husky Bites. We have about 65%, 67%. So the guess is the correct answer. Let's tell you the guess. There were 6% that picked A, there were 50% that picked B, there were 36% that picked C, and 8% that picked D. And the correct answer is C, 4.5 million pounds of steel in that lift span for this bridge. So thank you for participating in that polling question. And we'll let you go back to Emma. Tell us about some of the unique things about this bridge that made it special for its national landmark status. Yeah, so one of the sections we had to write about was unique features of this bridge. Um, one of which is just the type of it. It's a double deck vertical lift bridge, which is the only one of its type in the state of Michigan really uncommon nationwide. Um, I think the, the nearest just regular vertical lift bridge to this one is in Duluth. I don't even know where the nearest double deck one would be. Um, and most of the bridges of this type because they're so old are mostly converted into either pedestrian bridges or bike bridges or just demolished entirely. Um, and in contrast, this one is really well maintained as evidenced by all the recent construction projects that I'm sure a lot of the locals are sick of having to deal with. Um, and then in addition to being really well maintained, this also has a really high level of use, um, not only in comparison to other vertical lift bridges, but also just in comparison to other notable Michigan bridges like the Mackinac or the Blue Water or the International Bridge. Um, so that's pretty neat. And then finally, we touched on this in the last slide, um, the lift span weighs 4,584,000 pounds, which at the time of construction was the heaviest lift span in the world. Um, and one of the cool things about this type of the bridge and um, the double deck is that it's able to accommodate a whole bunch of different modes of transportation. It makes this bridge really versatile and really useful for this type of crossing. Um, in its fully closed position, obviously your, open, your upper deck is open for vehicles and your lower deck is open for rail or 
now with snowmobiles. Um, and your waterways closed except for like really small stuff. Um, the intermediate position, which I'll talk more about in a minute, is where you have your, your lift span is like partially raised. And so your upper deck is open for vehicles and then your lower deck is closed. And your waterway is open for like medium to small um, marine traffic, which makes up the majority of the marine traffic going through this crossing. And then finally, in the open position, your upper and lower decks are both closed and your waterway is open for all marine traffic, like say the Isle Royal boats, which are larger. And that's the only position that this bridge has where it's only open to one mode of transportation. Next slide, Michael. Oops, sorry. Thanks. You're good. <laughs> Um, so this intermediate position is the first time we'd ever seen um, a double deck lift span used in this way. Um, and as you can see in this picture on the left, what we mean by intermediate position is where that lift span is raised so that the bottom deck of lift span functions as part of that upper deck, um, the upper roadway deck. And doing this allowed the number of bridge openings to be reduced by 63% in comparison to the previous swing bridge, because the most common types of transportation that use this bridge are obviously road traffic and then small watercraft. Um, so that allowed this crossing to be a whole bunch more efficient, work really well for the area and the types of use that it was seeing most often. So to make this intermediate position happen, there were a couple of specific civil engineering advancements that needed to be made. Um, first off, that lower lift span deck needed to be usable by both rail and automobiles. And when we were talking to Tom DRC, the design engineer we mentioned earlier, he was telling us that because they didn't have access to a lot of the fancy materials and products that we do nowadays, they had to experiment with a couple different things that would let them properly embed the rails within that driving surface on the lower deck. And then also, they had these really neat movable intermediate bridge seats. So when the lift span is like fully down, it's just resting on basically the piers of the bridge and these, these little pieces of metal called bridge seats. And it's not relying on any of the mechanical equipment or the cables or the towers or anything. It's just sitting on something. And you want something similar to be happening when the bridge is in its intermediate position um, so that it's, it's sturdy when it's, you know has traffic going over it. But the problem is if you were gonna have a fixed bridge seat like the ones on the bottom, it would get in the way of the lift span moving up and down. And so they create, came up with these really large beams located at each of the corners of the towers. And they're pushed out with these hydraulics and rollers. So when they put the bridge into the intermediate position, they raise it up just like a little bit higher than the roadway. They push out these giant bridge seats on these giant beams, and then they set the lift span back down on top of them. Um, something really cool about these is if you go just walk underneath the bridge, you can go and see them and see how massive they are to hold up that really heavy lift span. So now we're at our last polling question before we wrap up a few more slides. But let's ask the question, how long did it take for the lift span to be installed? Was it one day, one week, one month, or one year? Michael had alluded to it earlier, and Emma's gonna tell us more about it because it is what really made the lift span, uh, this project, uh, very much more, another piece of the criteria that allowed us to get to the national status. So let's see, 235 attendees are online right now. And we have quite a few that have responded. For A, 28% said one day, 21% said one week, 37% said one month, and 14% said one year. The correct answer, that's A, one day. That's right, it took one day to install the lift span for this bridge. So Emma, why don't you tell us how they did that in one day? So um, the way that they installed the lift span was an early example of what we now call a bridge slide. Um, and it's accelerated bridge construction technique that we still use today. Um, the reason that they did this is you can see in this picture on the right, there is the, the, the truss kind of poking out from the right side of that picture. That's actually the swing span of the old swing bridge. And it's extending in between the towers of the new bridge. And so they, they really couldn't install the lift span in place like they normally would because it would stop all traffic going through this waterway, um, which would be really bad. They needed the waterway open. And so the solution to that was they constructed the lift span on land in Hancock and then floated it into place on barges. 
Um, and that all happened in the span of about 12 hours. I was reading a newspaper article last night um, that we had gotten from the Michigan Tech Archives a while ago. And it said that the, the waterway was only closed for, for less than 12 hours. Um, part of what made this so impressive is they only had four inches of clearance on each end of this 260 foot long lift span. So they had to be really precise about it um, when they were attaching it. And then once they got it into place, they attached it to the lift span or they attached it to the towers and then raised the lift span up all the way. So it was out of the way of that swing span and they could continue using the waterway while also continuing construction. Um, another fun fact about this, you see those black boxes on top of the lift span in that top left or the, the bottom left picture. Um, those are actually barges just filled with water. Um, we got this from the construction history report that John Michaels provided us. When they installed the lift span and attached it to the towers, it wasn't at its full weight yet. And so it didn't balance properly with the counterweights because the counterweights were, were already their full weight more or less. Um, and so to have the lift span be raised all the way and you know not putting a lot of, not needing a lot of mechanical power to make that stay that way, they add this extra weight in the form of these barges with the water in them. That's fascinating. So the final criteria for the nomination package was to prove that it had some social and economic significance as well um, to the nation. And so um, the kind of obvious one is that copper and lumber uh, taken out of this region went all over the country. And so this bridge and all the bridges before it uh, were crucial towards getting that uh, across the canal waterway here. Because like I said, this was the only uh, crossing and has really been the only crossing um, for pretty much the history of um, industry up here. Um, it made that, that uh, crossing much more efficient. And so it, it cut down that bottleneck and any amount that you can cut down the bottleneck in all these industries um, certainly helps. Um, and then today we have uh, still have an act, very active tourism uh, industry up here. And so, especially in the summer, you can see the traffic on that bridge increase quite significantly. And even in the winter, uh, the lower deck is still used for snowmobiles to go across, so they don't have to be on the road traffic. Now that we don't have trains going over, they um, pack down snow and allow the snowmobiles to go right onto the, the snowmobile trails right off the bridge. And then the automobile traffic carries on on top all winter. And so it makes it much more, much safer crossing for everyone involved. And then kind of just to conclude, um, the Portage Lake Bridge is a unique double deck lift bridge. Um, we weren't able to find many other double deck lift bridges to begin with, and especially none that kind of had this intermediate position um, and even are still in use fully where both decks are still technically used all the time up here. Um, it replaced a very aging and deficient swing bridge. Uh, it had the heaviest lift span in the world at the time of construction. Um, like I said, the intermediate position was quite revolutionary for that time. As Emma mentioned, they also had to uh, experiment with different materials and kind of figure out how to mix the rail and uh, automobiles. Uh, connected the Kiwanaz industries to the rest of the country and then just to lose focus, we did finally get it on the ASC Michigan and the national uh, ASC landmark list. And we should be, uh, as soon as some COVID stuff clears up, having a dedication ceremony for that where the bridge will have plaques for them. So. so thank you. Thank you, Michael and Emma. Um, and as Michael had said, you know, we did get accepted as the uh, designated for Michigan landmark designation, historic civil engineering landmark. And the national committee had met and approved our national uh, designation. And the next thing for us to do is to celebrate that. That happened in October of 2019. The plan was to celebrate it in June of 2020, but we got shut down for Bridge Fest. So we were gonna try again for Bridge Fest 2021 and that again was canceled. So we're shooting for Bridge Fest of 2022. We'll have a dedication ceremony 
um, with a bright, shiny bronze plaque that we'll get to mount on the, on the bridge or near the bridge. So with that, um, we are certainly open to questions. We have a number of questions here. Again, thank you, Emma and Michael. Um, so I'll just pop on one of these questions right away because it was a clarification. And when we were talking about the average traffic that was on the Portage Bridge versus the Mackinac Bridge, and you noted that one of the slides had maybe 30,000 AADT, and someone asked, what is AADT? So that's the average daily traffic that you can have on a bridge for any given time period. And it is about three to four times what the Mackinac Bridge sees on a daily basis, which is a whole lot, which is a whole lot. So there you go. So we have a number of questions in the q and I'm gonna ask Michael and Emma to pick one and answer one if they can find it or know of some that they have an answer to. I'm gonna do the same thing. Um, and I wanna answer the question, um, who paid for these bridges, <laughs> even though it says who paid for these brides. We'll, we'll go for who paid for these bridges. Um, so bridges, this is a public facility, a public um, transportation system. And so MDOT and federal funds were used to pay for the construction of this bridge. It is maintained through those types of funds. And if you follow those funds back even further, those are taxpayer dollars. So when you say who owns this bridge, somebody can say MDOT owns this bridge, but in my mind, it's the public that owns this bridge. And that's what really has been great. We've been able to see a lot of maintenance funding coming to the bridge and we need it for another 50 years. We need it at least, we can't afford to do without crossing. So. I will add to that though. Historically, um, I think it was Houghton County owned the bridge, but the rail companies actually helped fund some of the bridge. And for uh, the first uh, decade or so, they, uh, like the Copper Range uh, Railroad um, actually operated the bridge. And so it was their employee who, who lifted the bridge and maintained it. Um, and so the, the rail companies actually have a big hand in it historically until they started not needing to go across as much and then they wanted their hands clean of it. So they gave it over to the state. Yeah. But they also, they helped fund some of it and did also operate it because um, they were very, um, they really wanted that lower deck as part of the, the end package as well, instead of just being automotive, which I'm sure was part of some of the public's argument is they wanted just automotive up there or something. I'm gonna quickly answer Alexander's question. Yes, it's being recorded um, to watch it later or just send a link to a friend. Just give us a day to get it posted on the College of Engineering Michigan Tech website. Uh, and you can send a transcribed version. You can, you know, you can send the, the pre-show, you can send, um, you can share it with your friends. Yeah. Um, fascinating talk. Thank you so much. I've been, I've tried to keep quiet so that we could hear more about the bridge. So I'm going to go back and quiet again. <laughs> That's okay. That's great. We did get a question from Bill Bowman. Um, is the lift bridge the last major structure riveted instead of using high strength bolts? As some of you may know, the Mackinac Bridge opened two years earlier in 1957, and it was riveted. So Michael and Emma, do you recall? I know the answer. I'll ask you the answer. Emma? I don't know if it was the last one. Um, I do know it was like the tail end of the rivets era. Um, I don't know that there were too many after this one that would have been built using rivets. Yeah, I think uh, Dr. Madela told us that it was one of the last like significant bridges at least to have it and one of the last major crossings or named bridges to really use rivets. And today when rivets fail, they just put bolts in place instead. I would like to answer a, part, a question that kind of came in the very beginning before we even started presenting okay. was about whether the lift bridge has been hit. Um, and I, we kind of answered it. Um, and I guess it depends on what you mean by hit by what, because um, I don't know that it's been hit by boats. Um, as the person who asked, asked the question pointed out, it was uh, very close actually 
during one of the ribbon cutting ceremony, the yeah. ribbon cutting ceremony, a steamer actually came at it, but they were doing the ribbon cutting. And so they weren't quite prepared to lift it right away. And they had to drop anchor and, and tore phone lines and stuff and almost hit the lift bridge. So that was at least a close call. I'm not sure if any other bridges of significance hit it at least. Um, may, you know, maybe some small boats or a sailboat or something, but nothing uh, large. And then as far as vehicles go, um, it's actually more common than it probably should be that trucks don't realize how tall they are and the lift bridge <laughs> Clearance from the bot from the bottom of the operator's booth to the deck is actually lower than a lot of other bridges um, out there, and so a lot of bridges has hit the cross beams um, near the operator's booth or on the opposite side of the bridge. Um, and so there's, if you walk up there, you can see a lot of um, damage from trucks hitting it. And there's some that yeah, there's, plates there's up high there load. try and help save it, but. So it gets hit by trucks more than anything else. I, I witnessed one of those. I, I was on a, 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 one of one of our alumni's boats kind of <laughs> harbored there, and we we heard this screeching, grinding crash, and it was it was a yeah it it it, it got stuck. They had to like analyze and see what, what what's going on, and yeah, it was it was it was pretty dramatic. But <laughs> the bridge the bridge didn't wasn't damaged, I assure you, but the truck was. <laughs> Yeah, those high load hits. Sometimes, you know, people just don't realize how high their vehicles really are. And this bridge is, it's, it has the clearance that was required when it was built, but clearance today for new bridges is taller. So you really have to be careful with the um, clearance on the bridge. There is a question um, or a comment here. It says, there's a movie about the building of the bridge all good Uper students watched it in school. Mm -hmm. And I think, Emma, if you have the link to that, could you post that in the, can we do it in the chat box so that everybody can see the link to that? Um, so it is, there is a video on the building of the Portage Crossing. It's called Keweenaw Crossing. Um, and we'll get Emma to there we go. link it here. And is it posted? Oh, maybe the Facebook people can't see it. If um, you just Google Keweenaw Crossing and YouTube, it should just pop up like it's it's the first result. Um, okay, mm -hmm. Keweenaw Crossing. Really easy to find. Okay, great. Yeah, and that has a lot of information about all the construction and, and goes a little bit more in depth than Michael and I were able to in this short time. It's, it's really neat. Um, okay, are you guys looking at questions as well? Um, yes. Because this bridge, this is a good one because this is uh, this is kind of far reaching. Uh, because this bridge is the only link for people living north of the canal, why has a second bridge never been constructed? <laughs> when they were first building this, I know that they looked at a couple different locations. Um, and I, I think they ruled them all out mostly because it was hard for the rail to get there. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think Michael, maybe correct me if I'm wrong. I think they have a plan if the bridge is ever out of commission, they have a plan for setting up some sort of ferry service Yeah. to make sure that everybody can still get across. They do. There's a plan that the Coast Guard can actually float in a temporary bridge that floats on the canal. And I believe it goes from the uh, National Park Service dock across the waterway. Um, to the other side over near the smelter. And that's how they would, if the bridge was actually significantly um, out of commission, they would float that in to get people across. Um, and yeah, and you can kind of see in, in my background picture, all this open area at the top, that's all at rail yards that were designed specifically to go across the swing span. And that's one reason why they built it so close is because they just wanted to easily transition the rail and the roads over. Um, and some of the other areas um, along the canal here are either much wider or um, just honestly don't go to anywhere of significance, especially when it got to the point of the 60s here, you know, like Jake's, Jacobsville over there wasn't quarrying for the last 60 years. So there was nothing over that way and, and kind of, um, more west of here also it gets wider but also not much 
there to connect to. And so since all of the, the everything ran here for so long, all the infrastructure, they just decided to try and replace this bridge with a, a bigger one. And then later came up with an emergency plan. They wanted to make sure everybody had to drive past Michigan Tech and then go over the bridge. That's what I think. <laughs> <laughs> So here's a great question um, from one of our former students, Matt Dinah, also a civil engineering master's graduate from our program from many years ago. Are the presenters aware of any other bridges converted for snowmobile use and also open to vehicle traffic? This must be a very unique use. I don't know. We are know. not aware of that, of any others. <laughs> And we did not identify that as a unique feature. <laughs> I think we did in our report. I just didn't highlight it here. <laughs> oh, that that's a really good it's that's crazy. a really good question. Um, we have a question. What do they do with the lower level in the summer? Usually, I think it just sits in the intermediate position, so the, the lower level is just part of the road, um, and really, it's the upper deck that there's we're not doing anything with in the summer. Yes, as it is sitting today, not not in the picture that you have in your back. Going back to the it's um, down low, but the when they raise it up to the intermediate position, then the lower deck level becomes the upper riding surface. So then cars are passing through the truss at that time, and that allows for a lot more um, small craft on the water to get through without opening and closing it. Can you imagine? 63% reduction in openings of this bridge when the lift bridge went in versus the swing bridge. Can you imagine how many times that swing bridge was opening and closing and what kind of backups and hassle that would have been? Ooh, that would have been something. And I will say that the, the lower level is used in the summer for vehicles as well, kind of going off of that high load hit thing. Um, if there are vehicles that are too tall to go under the cross beams of the towers, then they lower the bridge um, for uh, large trucks to go uh, across the, the rail level and they can drive out that way because um, there's significant clearance underneath the bridge meant for the trains. Um, but that also means that um, trucks carrying higher loads, they just have to call ahead and they'll lower the bridge and get escorted across and then they um, basically go where the snowmobiles go during the summer, during the winter. So, so it is used in the summer as well for actual uh, traffic, just a lot less frequent. I did not know that. I'm just gonna, this is an amusing alumnus um, from 1969. Um, so in 1969, when we first got to Michigan Tech, the guys in the dorm decided we would go on a raid, whatever that means, of the nurses college, Sumi in Hancock. They marched down the road, chanting about their raid, marched through Houghton right up to the lift bridge that was raised. <laughs> so we walked back to our dorms, a happy group of freshmen. <laughs> this was my first and obviously memorable experience with the bridge. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that anonymous attendee. <laughs> so someone has asked, what is the proposed date of the dedication? And right now we have the tentative date is set for the Friday of Bridge Fest, which is June 17th, 2022. That's tentative because we still have to confirm that there are some officials that need to attend and we're trying to get those calendars cleared. So that's our proposed date would be to be the Friday of Bridge Fest and have it Friday morning so that the community can celebrate the bridge with us. Um, somebody asked, what is the expected lifespan of the bridge? How long can we expect this bridge to last? And when we design bridges, we used to design bridges for a 50 year lifespan. Today, we design new bridges for at least a 75 year lifespan, and that's based on reliability and structural analysis methods. But when it comes right down to it, if you take care of your bridge, your bridge should be there for as long as you need it to be there. If you're, and so the way we look at the bridge today, you know, it's more than 50 years old. It's getting a huge overhaul. In 2015, it started. 
to get all new cables and, and a lot of replacements. And now they're working, currently working on the expansion joints for the bridge. When the current construction, as you and I know it, because I'm driving over the bridge twice a day, um, when that finishes up, it'll go back into the lower position for the winter and we'll be driving on the upper deck. And at that time, they'll be working on the motors and some other parts of the bridge that they can work on during the winter time. That fix is expected for you know, another 50 years. We really have done a great job at maintaining this bridge. MDOT has, has really done an excellent job and we are fortunate to have it. Um, what happens when, if that bridge were to go out, well, we have emergency, we have an emergency action plan for those bridges. And the bridge has gotten stuck a few times over the years. It's been closed down for a few hours. And, um, but then we get it back in place and, and now we have new cables and it's been working great. So um, some other questions, Emma and Michael, do you see other questions that yeah, are? Yeah, I have. I have two that I want to answer here. Um, one is how deep is the, how deep below the water level are the, are the base of the caissons? Um, and so the water, I believe, is about 35-ish feet deep, um, 35 to 40 feet deep um, at the bridge. And then the bedrock is seven, the deepest caisson goes 75 feet below the water surface, so. Um, so they had a, a decent amount of sediment to go through also to get to bedrock, but so about 75 feet, I think was the deepest one. Does that sound about right, Emma? Sorry, I'm muted. That's right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, um, Dr. Oliburn, can we um, post these slides on our website? Because, um, for example, Lee would like to has asked if we could post the slides. We often do these for Husky Bites. Um, well, I think so. Okay. <laughs> yes, I can PDF them or-, or Yeah, no, that'd be great. PDF them and send them to Sue and we'll make sure that they are up on the Michigan Tech College of Engineering Husky Bites website. So my goal in having Husky Bites, I want people to be able to Google Husky Bites and not see pictures of dogs biting children. <laughs> I want Husky Bites Michigan Tech's Zoom webinar to come up first. All right, thanks. Yeah, uh, and then another one is, uh, are they using low RPM, high torque motors? Um, so I guess um, to answer kind of the question about the motors, um, they are probably much more, uh, they're probably much more powerful than they really need to be for its daily operation, uh, partly because how of the counterbalances. Uh, so the fun fact about the counterbalance is it's a lift span itself. So the whole part that moves, all that 4 million 500 um, pounds, 500,000 pounds is only uh, 1,500 pounds heavier than the counterbalances. So the lift span weighs 1,500 pounds more than the counterbalances, which is actually a pretty low amount when you think about how heavy everything actually is. And so part of that 2015 repair was they had to rebalance the counterbalances because over the years they've had to replace things or remove, uh, like remove the rail and stuff like that. And so the weights have changed over the years. And so they rebalanced them. But those lift motors are only ever up a lifting just over 700 pounds each um, if everything's balanced correctly. And obviously sometimes there's equipment on it like there is for construction now and it still lifts up, but daily operations, those motors actually shouldn't have to lift much. And the lift span is heavier than the counterbalances so that if something does go wrong, it doesn't get lifted up, it just stays down um, kind of thing, so. That also allows you to, uh, another fun fact about the bridge is that it can, it can be operated by hand, um, every aspect of it. So you can, um, we were told by one of the um, people who operates and maintains the bridge that sometimes when the bridge has gotten stuck, they literally have to go up into the towers with a wrench and rotate the motors themselves to get it 
uh, realigned correctly um, just because they don't have as much flexibility inside the control booth with the motors. And so they have to go up there and move it by hand. Um, and the, he said it's not incredibly difficult just because of the way it's, the gears are and, and um, the way that it's counterbalanced. But you can actually operate the entire bridge by hand if you wanted to, which is a good safety measure for anyone who is worried about if um, there was an electrical failure or something like that, is that it could still be moved to where it needs to be. There's so, so many, there's so many questions. We've answered 20. We have like 50 open. Questions. I know there's yeah. so many questions. Well, and, and perhaps this one, um, because it's based upon your work. So how many um, bridges nationwide have, have this national ASCE landmark status? I'd be curious about that myself. Hmm. I don't know the exact number, but I'll put this link in. Oops. Um, there is a website or there's a page on the ASC website that actually has a list of all the different places that have this this designation. I don't think the lift bridge is on the list yet. Um, Correct. The lift bridge yeah, will I'll be on a list after we do a dedication ceremony with the community. So, okay. and in the state of Michigan, there's just a handful. Um, oh, wow. The reason that I know about this program was because in 2009, I was contacted um, by another group that, or by the Michigan chapter of the American Society of Civil Engineers in, in an attempt to put a nomination package together for the Mackinac Bridge. So we were able to do a national landmark designation for the Mackinac Bridge in 2010. So it was kind of fitting that the lift bridge was going to be 2020 because that would have been 10 years later and it was ready to go. It's just the rest of the world wasn't quite ready for us to go. <laughs> well, and, and so we are coming up on the hour um, and I want to just read off a remark. Remember I went in the beginning, I introduced um, that I had had an email from Bill, class of 59 civil engineering. So he's written um, or, or, or posted a note that says, um, and I'm not going to say these words right, the pneumatic Kazon's shift work was two hours on, four hours off, and two more on. 35 PSI, and I went down once. This was a union building trades job. So Bill, thanks for joining us. I'm glad you were able to kind of zoom in. It was nice to get your note. And um, you know, I just think it's pretty cool that somebody who actually worked on the bridge is, is listening. So um, and so, I, I just want to make a quick comment that um, Audra, our department chair, Dr. Morse, has posted a response saying that now this is in, in the Upper Peninsula, there are six Michigan landmarks for ASCE, but that's in the Upper Peninsula, and the lift bridge will be the only one as a national landmark outside of the Mackinac Bridge. So that is really amazing for the Upper Peninsula. It's a, it's, it's a great opportunity to showcase what we really have up here. So Janet, I'll give it back to you if you wanna wrap up the program here for us. We really are grateful to be here. Yeah, well, I'll I say do. real quick is uh, everyone who's posted questions but didn't get them answered, you should hold on to those and come with, to our dedication ceremonies and then you can ask all your questions with unlimited time. So keep an eye out on Michigan Tech's pages for that. And then we can answer your questions later. Oh, I want to just stay on for like hours and answer questions. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm going to ask one more question. Um, so is, some, is there a lift operator there 24 seven, making sure that, how does, how do, does anybody know? They used to have an operator there 24 seven when there were a lot more ships coming through, but now they have just kind of dedicated no lift hours, which are like in the very middle, okay. middle of the night when no one really should be out on the canal anyway. Um, and there's, I think always an emergency line open to somebody. So if for some reason something needs to get through, um, they can call an emergency line and, and someone will come lift the bridge for them, but there's not always somebody there anymore, but there is somebody there uh, during the day um, all summer. Yep. Um, so if you're walking across, there's probably a guy in the booth there um, watching you, but. 
Well, and, and to wrap it up, I'll just say a few words and I'm going to pass it to Michael, who will pass it to Emma, who will pass it to Tess to say our actual closing words. I personally want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. I believe we've had a record attendance. Uh, and it's just so fun because there were actually questions being posted on Facebook Live that were being typed in the Q&A. So it's been, um, I learned a lot. Uh, I'm really impressed with um, this incredible work. Uh, thank you so much. Emma, Tess, and Michael for making sure that this amazing, beautiful, functional bridge um, made it to the National Registry uh, for, of ASCE. So to you, Michael. I guess I don't have too much extra to, to say. Just uh, it was a lot of fun learning about this bridge. And I currently live downtown Houghton where I get to see the bridge every day. So it's kind of nice to know about it and I get to nerd out to all my friends who come visit as we walk by so it's definitely a neat bridge and anyone who's not from around here should you know come up this way see the community and then also you know appreciate the bridge too. Emma. Well I don't live in Houghton anymore so I, I'm a little jealous of Michael being able to see it every day um, but I, I really had a good time doing this whole project and, and this whole presentation and um, definitely encourage everybody to go out and take a walk over the bridge, see if you see any of the cool features that we talked about. And um, yeah, glad I got to do this. Tess, thank you for your work with these amazing graduates and um, for your work across your career. Close us out. Thank you. Thank you, Janet, for inviting us. Thank you, oh, Michael and Emma. You did a great job all the way through this project from just walking in my office one day saying, I want to do this project. And I thought, okay, that sounds like fun. You know, right down to uh, the last details of sending all the information, finding these people. These guys really, really worked hard. I'm so proud of them. And I am really grateful to all of our attendees that are here today. You said there was a record attendance that was there was a lot of people online. I'm glad that you are here. I'm grateful for your questions. And like Michael said, we hope to see you at Bridge Fest 2022 on that Friday to um, get together and hopefully answer a lot more of these questions. So thank you again for asking us. You're welcome. Good night, everybody. Have a good evening. All right. Bye now.